You know, we have preached a lot of sermons here at Prophecies of Hope Church. A lot of different topics. We've studied a lot of different things. Think about those things for a few minutes. Um, think about all the books of the Bible that we've studied through. Uh, we've studied through Genesis. I think we've gone through, have we gone through Exodus? We've gone through Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Uh, we've been through Hebrews. I know we've been through Revelation several times. Um, have we been through John? I don't think so. Maybe not. Ro Romans. Have we been through Romans? Galatians. James. Okay. You know, a lot of different subjects. I guess to the top of the list would be who God is. Is he a father? That's what he reveals himself to be in Scripture. So why, why don't we believe that? We do believe that. We believe that he has an only begotten son, like the Scripture clearly says. And uh, that Jehovah is the father of Jesus Christ, and ultimately the father of us all. That's, it's a sobering thought when you think about it. Uh, um, you know, we've had many sermons and talks on the gospel, on salvation, on, as Paul puts it, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. We've talked about the last, what I believe is the last message of mercy to this dying world, and that is the three angels' messages of Revelation. A lot about prophecy here in this church, right? A lot about prophecy. In fact, we've had several years, is it six years or seven years? Of prophecy series. I'm not sure. It goes back to the end of 2012. And uh, sermons and talks and studies on most of the old prophets, I might say. Job, Moses, Abraham, and Isaac, even Ishmael, Sarah, and Hagar, and then Joseph. I really appreciate the, the account of Joseph in Scripture. Think about all these things that we've talked about, we've learned about. They're all examples of how God has worked with his people when they want to know him and they want to know the truth and they want to know his son. We've talked even recently about uh, the new earth that was in our Scripture reading. Thank you, Mark, this morning. And we talked this morning about judgment and some of those things, the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary, books being opened, Daniel says. And we've talked about Christ's second coming, Christ's coming back to this earth to receive God's saints, God's elect, Jehovah's elect. But my question this morning is, what about the rest of creation? What about the rest of creation? Have we talked about that? And as you'll see, it's a little play on words because the first text I have is going to take us to the beginning, to the beginning. In Genesis, here's the account right after Jehovah God finished the heavens and the earth. And that's what it says. Genesis 2, 1 and 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And that's where I get the title of my presentation this morning, The Rest of Creation. The rest that we find in the Sabbath day. And my sermon today, my presentation today is, is, is not going to prove the validity, the validity of the Sabbath or the fourth commandment or how those things God has instructed his people down through time to remember the seventh day. It's not about that. Today, it's more about what does the Sabbath really look like? I mean, what does it look like in a practical sense? 
What am I going to do or not do? How am I going to prepare for it? And I want to take all the guidance that I can find in the scripture about those things. I guess not all of the guidance because we'd be here for five hours, but I want to pick through a little bit and, and get some points where we can have an understanding of what God expects of us during this holy time. In fact, he, he, he said in the next verse, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. That's holy time. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. Well, I think we have a pretty good understanding of what blessed means. Because in some sense, all of us have been blessed. You know, all the world is promised a blessing through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? That God promised his son to us. And God fulfilled, has fulfilled his promise in giving his son. And we receive a blessing because of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. And not only his sacrifice but the life that he lives now to aid and help us. So a bless, being blessed, he blessed the seventh day. I think we have an understanding of that word, but what does it mean to be sanctified? It, he sanctified it. It's kind of, kind of a word we don't use today. We use the word blessing or blessed quite often. And here's a little definition that I dug out. To set apart as sacred. There, there's the Hebrew word. I, I probably shouldn't attempt to say it. But to set apart as sacred. This period of time, this seventh day, as consecrated, to dedicate it, to observe as holy, keep sacred, to honor as sacred. Now think for a minute. You think God would have done that just for that particular seventh day at the end of the creation week? Or do you really feel like it applies to every successive seventh day throughout the, all of Earth's history? And if it does, that means that we stand or sit here in holy time now. Something consecrated, something made holy. There's a song that talks about this temple made of time. It's a beautiful song. And it's recognizing that God has made something special, something that only he could do, because he's the creator. It's pretty striking when you think about it. He set apart one day a week. Let's compare that to something else in scripture. You know, God tells us, that we should give a tenth of our increase to him. A tenth. But here, when he sanctified and blessed one day out of seven, that's more than one tenth. One seventh is more than one tenth. He puts more emphasis on this one seventh of our time than he does the physical increase that we have. I think that's significant to me. So I want to take from scripture some examples about how the Sabbath is going to look from week to week. And the best place to go, first of all, I think, is an account in the Old Testament where the children of Israel were having some trouble with uh, keeping the Sabbath. And so I want to direct your attention to the book of Nehemiah. It's not a place that we go to very often. Now let me set this up for you. Nehemiah was a prophet of the Lord, a true prophet. <clears throat> and he was given the task by God of directing essentially the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple after the Babylonians had, 70 years after the Babylonians had come in and destroyed everything. So there's problems, logistical problems, with everything that's happening. In fact, at one point, th these marauding tribes would come in 
and the people rebuilding the wall would have to have a trowel in one hand and a spear and a sword in the other so that they, they could defend themselves while actually rebuilding the walls of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. But this is a different problem. And let's just read the account, several verses here from Nehemiah. In those days, he's saying, saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and, and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs and all manner of burdens, which they brought unto Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre. Now I take to mean by men of Tyre, those are men outside of, of the Israelites. Also therein which, which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Jews, Judah and in Jerusalem. And he continues. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that you do? And profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not your God bring all this evil upon us? He's talking about, excuse me. Hmm? Uh, here I go again. I can't get the text right. Should be Nehemiah chapter 13. Did not your fathers thus, and did not your God bring all this evil upon us? And he's referring to the children of Israel not keeping the Sabbath days in the past. That's one of the big reasons that God allowed the Babylonians to take them. Upon this city, yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. He continues. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, now, this is a great indication about when the Sabbath starts, at the end of preparation day when the sun is setting. I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open until after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. You know, would God have us be forced to keep one of his commandments or to do it from the heart. So I find this a little difficult that Nehemiah, the person God has chosen to be in charge, has to essentially force the people out who are doing all the burdens, all the work, selling things on the Sabbath day, and close the gates in Jerusalem so not even the people in Jerusalem have access to these things. And he continues. So the merchant and the settler of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or tri twice. Uh, Mark, do you see that on the screen? It's, uh, yeah, there's something covering my screen. So they were selling all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice, then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do it again, I will lay hands on you. And from that time forth, they came no more on the Sabbath day. So the children of Israel, they're back to their old tricks of doing things on the Sabbath day. And in fact, Nehemiah has to close the gates and force them into essentially keeping the commandment of God. But what does this tell us about the practicality of what's going to happen in our lives from week to week on the Sabbath? You know, is it right that I should force someone else into breaking the Sabbath? Should I be out making other people work for me when it's not a necessity on the Sabbath? I don't think so. Should I be out doing things where other people are gainfully employed on the Sabbath day when, when, you know, if it was up to me, I should be allowing those people to have that rest. And we'll see by the end of the sermon that someday that will be the case. Where there won't be the necessity, even the necessities that we have in life today, that things that need to be done on the Sabbath are going to be done away with in the new earth. 
You see, Jesus made it pretty clear. <clears throat> when we think about the Sabbath, it can't be a burden to us. It really can't. Because if it's a burden in our hearts and minds, then what really is the validity of the Sabbath when it comes to rest? If we're always thinking about things that need to be done, it's really going to take a mindset and a heart set change to be able to understand and get a true blessing that God intended for the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus said, mm, here's one more text from Nehemiah, but Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That's from Mark 2.27. You mean the Sabbath is for our benefit? It's supposed to be. It really is for our benefit. Why would God set aside one-seventh of the time that we have for us? He must know something about us that maybe we don't recognize ourselves. The Creator knows best for His creatures, does He not? Well, what can we do on the Sabbath? I think God set aside two days of the week with names. There's preparation day and the Sabbath day. And there's a reason that Friday, we call it today, was called preparation day by Jehovah God. There's a reason for that. It's so that we can truly rest not only physically, but from the cares, from the worries that we have in everyday life. So what can we do on the Sabbath day? What do we do? We have a pretty good example of what we can do. Let's turn again to Mark. And I'm going to read this account about what Jesus did on the Sabbath. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man which had a withered hand. And they watched him, meaning the scribes and Pharisees, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth, and he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? To save life or to kill? They didn't want to answer, did they? They held their peace. So what's Jesus' example to us? Is it a good idea to take time to do something for someone else? Let's be a blessing. Let's reveal the blessings that God has given us. To someone else. Even if it takes a lot of effort. So the next text is the end of this. And when they had looked around about on them with anger and being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole like the other, as the other. Jesus made it a point to do good for other people using the Sabbath hours, giving the blessings away that he had received from his Father. What a great principle. I mean, this is one of the core principles that we, see, we can apply in our own lives. And it may be difficult at first. I find that difficult because most of the times on the Sabbath, I, I want to come and worship and fellowship, but I really want to go home and take a nap at some point. But why aren't I using the blessings that God has given me to help somebody else? It can be spiritually. It can be physically. It can be using the means that God has given us to put in someone's hands that really needs it. You know, there's necessities that have to take place even on the Sabbath, okay? Pretty much have to eat and drink. 
You know, there's people in the hospital that really need care. We have to have police officers, unfortunately. We have to have firefighters, unfortunately. Think of all the things that are absolutely necessity, absolute necessities. We appreciate very much that the heat is on here in this sanctuary today, that the lights are on. And there's somebody there sitting, watching those switches to make sure everything goes right so the heat stays on, not only for our church here, but for people who need heat in their homes this time of year. So I'm going to turn to Luke, and, because Jesus addresses even these necessities. <coughs> Excuse me. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them, therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Can you believe it? The Lord then answered him and said, You hypocrite, did not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to be watered? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from, the bond, from this bond on the Sabbath day? See, this woman had come to Jesus. She had this blood issue problem for eighteen years. Eighteen years. You think Christ was going to turn her away one more day so that she'd be healed on the first day of the week rather than the Sabbath? I don't think so. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. You see, there are necessities that need to happen even on the Sabbath day. And there's good examples of that throughout the scripture. In fact, the priesthood that God set up in the earthly sanctuary in the Old Testament times. The priests there had to work more on the Sabbath day than they did any other day of the week for all the rituals and things that God had asked them to do. Was that sin to bring glory to God above? No, no it wasn't. You know, when we talk about the Sabbath, There's a lot of things that we may not understand at first. It's, it's a difficult subject because most people don't understand the depth of the blessing that they can receive on the Sabbath. If their mindset is changed and they understand in a spiritual sense what a tremendous blessing God can give us on the Sabbath. So I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians and these are concepts that I know that most of us understand because what, the, what these texts are saying is that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That we understand the deep things of God with more study, with more prayer, coming to a close relationship through Jehovah God, through his son. And here's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, verse 12 through 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So what's Paul saying here? If we don't receive the spirit of God, if we don't have a spiritual understanding, how can we know the things of God? And, and if you do some other reading, I, the previous text before this talks about how we have a spirit inside of us. We know the things because we understand things that are human when we have the Spirit of God in us, then He infuses knowledge and wisdom and love and all the goodness of His character into us and we understand deeply the things that are spiritual. Well, he goes on, he says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural man, in other words, me alone, without the Spirit of God, where am I? I don't, know, I don't know these things. Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
And this applies to the Sabbath truth also. The fourth commandment. The day that God set aside, blessed and sanctified. If we're going to have an understanding of how it's going to practically fit into all the blessings that God wants to give me on a week-to-week basis, I have to know these things on a spiritual level. They have to transcend the natural man. And it's an element of faith. It really is an element of faith. That's my next slide, Matthew chapter 9. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment for or because she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. That was the faith that she had. But Jesus turned about him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. It takes an element of faith to understand the deep meaning of the Sabbath. The blessings that we receive on that day from true physical rest and spiritual rest. So what can we do? Well, number one, we can prepare. And the Bible isn't silent on that. In fact, I just talked about how Friday was known as preparation day before the Sabbath. Not only a thousand years before Christ, but right at Christ's very death. They wanted to get his body off of the cross because it was preparation day and the Sabbath hours were coming. Back in Exodus, this is what uh, Moses wrote down. And he saith unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto Jehovah. Bake that which you will bake today, and seethe, or boil, that's what what you will boil, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept in the morning. So the principle is, Let's do what we need to do in necessities for the Sabbath. If we can prepare, let's do that. There's always going to be things come, that come up during holy time that weren't expected. And Ed, last night was one of those things. Ed called me yesterday afternoon. He was over here at the apartment next to the church. And he said, both of the space heaters we have just keeping minimal heat in the building could put they're gone. The fans won't work on either one of them. And man, I thought, that is really odd. That is really odd. And I thought back this week, I had heard on the news that 500 customers uh, from the power company were with, were with out power here in, in Stanton. So we talked about it and he said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to go to Lowe's and, and get a couple of small heaters to replace it. So I met him over there. We, we made that purchase. He had to run around a little bit to collect them. And he got them both working, but still the power is not right over there next door. And it's still not right. So the Sabbath hours came on, and Ed and I were still trying to determine whether the building was going to be safe over the Sabbath hours or not. And we had several times when we prayed about it. And we tried to do everything that we could with our knowledge and We just decided we're going to have to leave the rest in God's hands. And that's what we did. We had prayer at the end. And we left these buildings in God's hands. Because we'd done everything that we could possibly think about doing. And that was an emergency. Normally I wouldn't go out for something like that. And and wouldn't do something of a mechanical or work nature like that. But there's going to be emergencies. Here the principle from Exodus is, let's prepare what we can. In fact, another good example, which I don't have in my notes or on my slides, is is when God provided manna for the children of Israel in the wilderness. You know, for six days, uh, five days out of the week, he would provide each of them the regular amount. On the sixth day, he asked, he, he provided the same amount, asked them to gather in double. 
And it was the only night through the whole week where it would remain until morning and through the next day to give them sustenance. What a miraculous thing. If we put faith out there to Jehovah God, he's going to sustain us. He's going to sustain us. So in a practical sense, what have we seen? We've seen, let's prepare for the Sabbath. Let's avoid doing those things that are typically the regular things that we do throughout the week. Our commerce, our coming and going. Let's prepare, let's avoid those things that are regular things. And you know, because Sabbath has been sanctified or made holy or set apart, where should our minds be on this day? You should be on spiritual things as much as possible. I think that's one of the big reasons God knew in his wisdom to set apart one seventh of our time. So I want to go to our scripture reading today, Isaiah 66. And look at the context. The context is everything. For as in the new heavens and the new earth, It's going to be a beautiful time. And the time will never end. Jehovah says here, God says, that our name will remain. There'll be no end to who we are. To the person we've become under the guidance and direction of God's Son. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh to come worship before me, saith the Lord, saith Jehovah. We're going to have Sabbaths in the new earth. So think about it. Think about it a little bit. And my next, maybe I should just go to the next text that I have. We need to think this through because it's exciting. This is from Revelation 21. And and basically... um, it's, it's saying essentially the same thing because the premise of the text is the same time frame, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And continuing, it says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, or his dwelling place, right? And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So in the new earth, let me ask you, if there's no pain and no death, are we going to need nurses? Nope. We're going to need firefighters or policemen? There's going to be a lot of people out of jobs. I can see that. (laughs) Think about those things. In fact, the necessities of life, Revelation makes it clear, that are going to to be provided by the Father, Jehovah God, and His Son. The tree of life will be there. We don't have to worry about preparing food for the Sabbath. There's a text in Revelation chapter 7 where it says, the Lamb will lead all of the saints to the river of living water. We won't have to prepare for the Sabbath. Not like we do here. What a blessing. What a blessing to think about what God has in store. The Sabbath in eternity. With him and us in communion. It boggles my mind because I can't think of all the things that are going to be done away with. That we won't have to worry about at that point. 
So I hope this has helped you in a practical way. Our hearts and minds need to be changed into an understanding of what the Sabbath really is. That we need to prepare for the Sabbath. So that all those things that we can prepare for during the Sabbath, those things are done and set aside. We don't have to worry about those things. And our minds need to be in a place where it's on spiritual things as much as possible. About the blessings God has given us during the past week and at the end of the day on Sabbath, the blessings that we're asking him for for the new week. If we, in those principles, can find practical ways to remember the Sabbath day, keep it set aside, and keep it holy in our hearts and minds. That's my prayer today. And that's what I'm hoping that these principles will instill in each one of us straight from Scripture. So just one thought at the end, and that is from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's a blessing. But by faith, we need to take hold of that blessing and in practical ways keep the Sabbath holy, just like the commandment says.